Hello, my friends, and welcome to our video lecture on topic B2.3, cell specialization. Our guiding questions for today, what are the roles of stem cells in multicellular organisms, and also how are differentiated cells adapted to their specialized functions? Our objectives, we are going to describe stem cells in terms of differentiation and their functions. We're going to outline some examples of using stem cells in therapies. We're going to describe differences in cell sizes and how that makes them adapted to their specialized functions. We're also going to describe adaptations for increasing cell surface area, again, so that those cells can carry out their specialized functions. And we will wrap up with a discussion of some examples of specialized cells. Us multicellular organisms carry out a lot of cell reproduction so that we can become multicellular. Many of our cells do reproduce themselves via mitosis. Some of the functions of mitosis, the reasons that we need to reproduce cells, is for growth. An example is here. So we all started as zygotes. A zygote is a structure formed during fertilization when egg and sperm combine. Eggs and sperms are our gametes. Gametes are cells that are what we call haploid. They only have half the DNA of our regular body cells. When those two uh, gametes, one egg, one sperm, combine, we go back to the normal number of chromosomes, the normal amount of DNA. And again, that first formation, that single-celled formation resulting from fertilization is called a zygote. That zygote is going to go through mitosis, and we're going to end up with more cells and more cells and more cells, which is pretty cool. The di that zygote does divide pretty rapidly. And what's pretty cool is that the original cells, these first couple groups of cells, are quite undifferentiated. They are all the same. There isn't any specialization. Once we get to this blastocyst gastrula stage, then we end up with some cells that are a little bit more specialized. And the reason for that specialization is some cells are turning on and off specific groups of genes and other cells are turning on and off different groups of genes. This allows us to have specialized cells and we can end up being these pretty fabulous multicellular organisms. Other jobs of mitosis, we're going to repair some tissues. Sometimes we get hurt and we need to fix our tissues. We might also have in that tissue that needs to be repaired, some dead or some damaged cells that need to be replaced. One of the ways that we can turn on and turn off those genes, activate, deactivate those genes, is through cell signaling. In cell signaling, we're going to take some information, we're going to transfer it from the surface of a cell to the nucleus, where those genes are, because that's where we need to turn them on and turn them off. One of the ways that we can transfer this information is through these chemical signals, these molecules called morphogens. We can have different concentrations of morphogens in different areas of a structure. So here we have more morphogen here. Those cells divide, we have more morphogen here. And over time, many cell divisions, we can differentiate those different groups of cells into back versus front. We can differentiate them into head versus tail. And that allows us to differentiate these cells. We can have different body parts, different body structures and areas due to this cell signaling. Morphogens on the cell surface at different concentrations will turn on and turn off different genes in the nucleus, which allow us to have all those amazing different kinds of cells. What's kind of crazy is that often, once we have those cells specialized, they lose their ability to reproduce. Our brain cells, our other nerve cells, muscle cells, once we have those cells specialized, they can no longer go through mitosis. What we've got is what we've got. Um, we could have stem cells that might come in and replace those specialized cells, but those cells cannot go through mitosis. They're done. We call it G0 or mitotic arrest. Remember that mitosis is that cell division of eukaryotic cells. Arrest means to stop. So mitotic arrest is stopping mitosis, or we call it cell stage G0, um, and then those cells just aren't reproducing. We do have some specialized cells that are able to continue to divide. An example is in the small intestine. So this is a tiny little chunk of small intestine. Um, the, the food 
is traveling this way through the small intestine. We call that the lumen of the small intestine. Um, and these are the cells of the wall of the small intestine. We have some stem cells in this crypt. Those stem cells start as indifferentiated cells, and then these undifferentiated cells can reproduce, reproduce, and will replace our small intestine wall cells. This is called the endothelium, the inside wall of the small intestine. We actually replace the endothelium, the inside of our small intestine, every four to six days because the food traveling through damages, breaks down those cells so fast. Um, we do have to replace those cells crazy, crazy quickly. Again, you have a whole new inner wall to your small intestine every four to six days. Crazy sauce. So these stem cells, I mentioned in the previous slide. So stem cells are cells that are capable of dividing endlessly, and they are also able to differentiate among multiple roots. So stem cells are not yet differentiated. They are capable of differentiating into multiple kinds of cells. We just call them stem cells in us animals and us humans. Stem cells are cells that are capable of dividing endlessly and then also becoming all kinds of cells. In this graphic, we see these cultured stem cells could become muscle cells or blood cells or nerve cells. Cardiac cells are heart muscle cells. We could have liver cells. We could have those intestine cells. So stem cells in us animals are able to differentiate into lots of different kinds of cells. They start out as undifferentiated, but they're capable of going through differentiation. In our plants, we have, we don't call them stem cells, we call it meristem, but it's the same idea. We have this meristem tissue, we have a lateral, and then we also have some apical, apical meristem. And this is the, these are the stem cells of plants. Our apical meristems are at the root and the shoots of the plant and they elongate the plant so the plant can grow taller. Those roots can grow deeper with the apical, apical meristem. Ooh, I definitely just, uh, sorry, covered up that word, apical meristem. And then lateral meristem, what's here, widens the stem or widens the trunk if it's a tree. So Lateral meristem makes the stem, the, the trunk of a tree, grow wider, wider, wider. And then apical meristem um, is our shoot and our root so that the plant can grow taller and those roots can grow deeper. In us animals, we have some stem cell niches, um, also in plants, but I'm going to focus more on, on us animals, us humans, and our stem cell niches, these areas where we have high numbers of stem cells. In us adults, we have um, a, a big stem cell niche in our bone marrow, um, and then also our hair follicles. And, and lots of stem cells in this area. Those stem cells are going to go through lots of mitosis. And during mitosis, they're going to make some more stem cells. Sometimes they'll divide into a stem cell and then a differentiated cell. We call this a symmetrical division because I don't have two of the same cells, I have two different cells. One of them will be a stem cell, which can then go through mitosis again and become more stem cells. So it kind of um, auto populates its stuff, self, we call that self renewal. But then we can also differentiate some of those cells into the specialized cells that we need. If this is bone marrow, then some of that bone marrow is going to become more bone marrow that can become more bone marrow. That's self-renewal. Some of those bone marrow cells will actually start to mature, differentiate into those specialized blood cells, white blood cells or red blood cells, T cells and B cells. Those stem cells, we have quite a few different kinds of stem cells, and we can categorize them based on their potential to differentiate. We can also classify them based on their sources. So different sources of stem cells, we can get them from embryos. Our embryonic stem cells tend to have the most potential for differentiation. We can also get them from fetuses. We could get them from the umbilical cord right at birth. We also do have some adult stem cells like that bone marrow. The differentiation potential, so this is how uh, many different ways, how many different pathways these stem cells could 
go down in terms of differentiation. So how many differentiation pathways are there? Our totipotent stem cells are totally able to differentiate into everything. Really only the zygote is totipotent. So our zygotes can differentiate into anything. The zygote cell can differentiate into um, fetal cells, liver cells, brain cells. They could also differentiate into umbilical cord cells or placenta cells. Once we have this blastocyst, we lose a lot of potential. Now we only have pluripotent cells. Um, embryonic stem cells are pluripotent. This part of the blastocyst is going to become the embryo. This part is going to become the placenta. These cells here cannot become placenta, and these cells here cannot become embryo. So we've already lost a little bit of the potential. We are no longer totipotent stem cells. We're only pluripotent. There are lots of options. These cells here can still become brain and liver and big toe cells, um, but they cannot become placenta cells. So some of that differentiation, that ability to differentiate has been lost. As it goes through more developmental stages, we get down to multipotent stem cells. Our bone marrow is multipotent. Bone marrow can become red blood cells, white blood cells, B cells, T cells. We'll talk more about that when we get to our unit on physiology. But bone marrow cells cannot become brain cells. Bone marrow cells cannot become skin cells. And so we only have many, like, really just a few, not many, um, multipotent stem cells, bone marrow. There are some pathways, but not that many anymore. And then there's one more kind of um, differentiation potential that I'm going to throw in here. So unipotent, you can probably guess, means that you can differentiate into only one kind of cell. Unipotent stem cells can differentiate into only one kind of cell. We have these special cells called spermatocytes. They're stem cells that can become sperm cells and nothing else. So these guys are unipotential. They can become cells, but they can only become sperm, sperm cells. We can use some of these stem cells to treat, this is the idea of therapy, to treat lots of disorders. So therapeutic cloning is one way that we can take stem cells and we can clone these stem cells to treat or provide therapies from disorders. One of the ways that we do this is through somatic nuclear transfer, which is an amazing piece of technology. So what we do here is we take a somatic body cell. Somatic just means body cell. This is kind of repetitious. So we're going to take a body cell that has the desired genes. Maybe someone has leukemia and we want to treat that leukemia, we're going to take some um, cells that have the nucleus of the patient because we want the patient's genes. We don't have any um, organ rejection issues. So we're going to take that body cell, we're going to take the nucleus out of the body cell. We're also going to take an egg cell. We're going to take the nucleus out of the egg cell. We now call this an anucleate, an anucleate cell. It doesn't have a nucleus. We're going to take the nucleus from the adult's body cell, our patient's body cell, and we're going to smash it into that egg. And so I now have what we call somatic because it's the body cell, nuclear because I transferred the nucleus into this egg cell. Egg cells are really good at going through mitosis. And so these cells, we can get it to divide, 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 divide. And now I have this big beaker full of cells, stem cells that are genetically identical to my patient. And then I can use these stem cells to treat my patient's disorder. This can be the bone marrow transplant. And I'm not worried about rejection. I'm not worried about, about the immune system attacking the patient because these are literally the genes of the patient. This is called therapeutic cloning. For some of us, um, this is an ethical way for us to treat diseases, even though this blob of cells does have the potential to become an embryo. Reproductive cloning, we frown on this quite a bit more. So in reproductive cloning, we would take that blob of cells and we would put it into a surrogate mother's uterus and allow it to grow into a whole entire organism. 
We do this with some mammals. If you've ever heard of Dolly the sheep, Dolly was produced, uh, Dolly the sheep, not a human. Um, she was produced via reproductive cloning, somatic nuclear transfer. Um, this for humans, we find very, very unethical. Um, therapeutic cloning, a little bit more ethical, but definitely still some issues because we do produce an embryonic stem cell group with the potential to develop into a whole entire embryo, a whole entire human. So once our cells go through differentiation, we have all of these specialized cells, and it's pretty cool as they come in a wide variety of sizes. So I'm gonna start in this in this bottom left corner. So we have some cells um, called neutrophils. These are part of our immune system. Macrophages are also immune system cells. Hepatocytes, these are liver cells. Megakerocytes, these guys produce platelets. Platelets are in our blood and they help us clot um, blood when we are injured, when we're bleeding. Um, platelets help to form scabs to stop us from bleeding. Um, adipocytes, these guys store fat um, in our bodies. Um, here we have a motor neuron. Motor neurons are nerve cells that control um, muscles. Remember, they have these crazy long axons. We have some motor neurons that go from our spinal cord, from our tailbone, all the way down to our toes. So, so you can imagine that the lengths of these axons can be crazy, crazy big. This guy, this um, Purkinje cell, is in the cerebellum of our brains. And then we've got lots of muscle cell over here. So some skeletal muscle is a little bit bigger than our cardiac or heart muscle cells. These guys are pretty cool. They are, um, we've talked about their multinucleate. And so these guys have multiple, many nuclei here. Makes them kind of an atypical weird cell. Here's an egg cell. Sometimes we call it an ovum. Um, and you can see that it is quite large. So, so this egg cell compared to this white blood cell, our egg cells are pretty ginormous. One of the challenges of our really big cells is that we have a less favorable surface area to volume ratio. So we're going to talk about some of the constraints on cell sizes. Why do we have a bunch of little cells instead of one or five really, really giant cells? Um, and, and this surface area to volume ratio is one of the reasons that we have fairly small cells most of the time. Think of surface area in terms of like the cell membrane. So that space, that surface around the outside of the cell, and the volume is going to be all the stuff inside the cell that we need to feed. I'm gonna pretend, even though it's definitely not accurate, like our cells are similar to spheres. And so the formula for surface area of a sphere is four pi r, whoa, r squared, four pi r squared. And then our volume is going to be four thirds pi r cubed. So let's say that I had a cell with a radius of one. My surface area is going to be four pi one squared. My volume is going to be four thirds pi r cubed one cubed. This turns into just four pi. This turns into four thirds of pi. And so my ratio is going to be four pi to four thirds pi. Pi's cancel out, fours cancel out, and then the denominator of the denominator. Remember that this is like dividing by the fraction in which we take the, we multiply by the reciprocal. Uh, we end up with the denominator of the denominator becoming the numerator. And so our, our ratio, our ratio, which remember is a fraction um, of the surface area to the volume of a cell with a radius of one is going to be three. If I plop that cell up to, let's do two. So I'm gonna make the radius two now. My surface area is going to be four pi two squared. Two squared is four, that's 16 pi. And then my volume is going to be four thirds pi. Two times two times two is eight. Four times eight is 32. So I have 32 thirds of pi. My ratio is going to be 16 pi to 32 thirds, 32 thirds of pi. Pi's cancel out, I have 16 and 32 reduces down to one over two. So now I have one over, one over two over three. This is the same thing as dividing by a fraction. We're going to multiply by the reciprocal and we get three over two. And so my ratio has gone from three 
down to three halves. That's the same thing as 1.5. I chopped my ratio in half when I doubled the size of this radius. And so I don't have as much surface area to feed the volume of my cell when my cells get bigger. This can be a problem. It's hard for us to keep care of that whole entire inside of the cell if I don't have enough surface area to transport nutrients in and get waste products out. And so we have some super cool adaptations to increase surface area to volume ratios so that we have lots of surface area to feed the volume on the inside of the cell. One of the things that we can do is to change the shape of the cell. And so here you can see that we have changed the shape to include all these crazy long projections. This is a nerve cell. These projections are dendrites and axons. Lots and lots of cell membrane that allows us to diffuse or transport things in and out of the cell. Another thing that we can do is with red blood cells, we make these um, cells almost donut shaped. so a little bit concave. And so instead of being big spheres, they instead have little divots on the tops and the bottoms. And that again increases the surface area to volume ratio. Here, this is the inside of one of the tubes in our kidneys. So this is called, um, this is a cell from the distal convoluted tubule. Mm, distal convoluted tubule of a kidney. And its job is to absorb nutrients before those nutrients are lost in the urine, before that, that um, those solutions head to the bladder and then are excreted from the body. So the distal convoluted tubule in our kidneys is going to collect some of those nutrients before we pee them away. So what happens is we have these cells and they're kind of cube shaped. So they're kind of cube shaped so that they stick together pretty well. They have all of these super cool villi, and then they have these microvilli. Microvilli are little projections of the um, cell membrane of these cells, and it simply increases the surface area. We call this area where there are all these multi, um, sorry, microvilli, these microvilli, this is called the brush border because it kind of looks like a brush that borders where all of the, the, the solution that's going to become the urine is passing. We also have, oh my gosh, so, so many mitochondria in here for all the active transport that we need in order to get those nutrients through the brush border into the cell. And we've also got lots of capillaries nearby so that we can dump those nutrients into the bloodstream to keep them in the body instead of losing them as urine. So lots of different ways that we can increase surface area to volume ratio. We can change the shape. We can add some projections. We can add these special projections called microvilli, this brush border. And we're going to wrap up lecture with a look at a few specialized cells. This first one that we're going to look at um, are cells in the alveoli of our lungs. Um, alveoli are like these little bubbles at the ends of the tubes where air flows in and out of our lungs. And their job is gas exchange. So the alveoli is how we're going to get carbon dioxide out of our blood and oxygen into our blood. So two specialized kinds of cells in our alveoli, we have type one pneumocytes. Pneumocytes simply means mm, pneumo is a uh, lung and site is cell. So you have type one lung cells, pneumocytes, and type two pneumocytes. The job of the type one pneumocyte is literally to exchange gases. So we are going to grab onto some oxygen and get rid of some carbon dioxide. They are crazy flat and thin. So here's type one pneumocyte. You can see how crazy flat and thin they are. They share membranes with capillaries. So the capillaries come super close to those type one pneumocytes. So it's super easy to move those gases into um, the blood or out of the blood. They're also joined together super tight so that we don't have too much fluid, too much water um, oozing out of the blood and into the alveolus. The other kind of cell that we have are type two pneumocytes. If you have ever blown up a balloon, but instead of like tying off the balloon, you just let the air out, you might notice that the balloon kind of sticks to itself. So, so all the vapor from your air, from your, your breathing um, goes to the inside of the balloon. And then those water molecules from the water vapor from your lungs sticks the walls of the balloon together. 
we have a lot of vapor inside our alveoli, inside of our lungs, and that water vapor is going to want to stick to the other water vapor molecules, which means that our alveoli should really love to stick closed, but we don't want that to happen because then we cannot exchange the gases. And so we have these special type two pneumocytes, these special type two pneumocytes, and their job is to secrete a special kind of thing called a surfactant. That surfactant is going to reduce the surface tension that stickiness of the water vapor inside the lungs. Those type 2 pneumocytes have microvilli, tiny little projections just like the, the kidney cells had, so that there's more surface area for more secretion of that surfactant. And they're also cube-shaped because we can fit a whole lot more organelles into uh, a nice fat cell as opposed to these thin cells that are the type 1 pneumocytes. Another example of specialized cells are muscle fibers or muscle cells. Here we have some cardiac muscle fibers. So these are the muscle cells of our heart. And then here we have some skeletal or striated muscle fibers, striated um, muscle fibers. And these are the muscles that we would find, the kinds of muscle cells that we would find um, like in our biceps or our quadriceps. So muscles that are attached to bones. The cardiac cells are pretty cool. Um, so these guys, these guys have just one nucleus each. Each of the cardiac muscle fiber cells has only one nucleus, but they are branched. And that, bra whoa, branched, I can spell. Um, that branching allows for the cardiac muscle fibers, these muscle cells, to contract together. We want to be able to coordinate the contraction of the cells of the heart so that the two atria contract together and the two ventricles contract together. Um, if you don't know our hearts, our hearts are composed of four chambers. We have two atria at the top and then two ventricles underneath. And we want those two atria to contract together. We want those two ventricles to contract together. And so the branching of these cardiac muscle cells allows them to contract quite beautifully um, in a coordinated fashion. We also have, um, so these skeletal or striated muscle fiber cells are super cool. They're so cool, we're like, are they even cells? Because they do a bunch of things that is weird. So we call them atypical cells, or maybe they break cell theory. They are multinucleate, so they have so, so, so many nuclei. That's weird. Most cells just have one. These guys can also be crazy, crazy long. Um, we talked about the sartorius muscle that goes from basically our hips down to our knees. Um, so cells, the length of that, that femur bone uh, is pretty crazy, um, but they also are composed of contractile protein fibers so that those muscles can contract. But are they cells? Are they not cells? We don't know, um, but they're pretty cool and kind of weird. And the last example of a specialized cell that we're going to look at are the gametes. We mentioned these at the beginning of the lecture. So gametes are eggs and sperm. Um, gametes are what we call haploid. They have half the amount of DNA that a normal body cell would have. But what's magical is when half the DNA from the sperm meets half the DNA of an egg, then we get back to the whole amount of DNA that we're supposed to have. These guys are a little bit different. So sperm are quite a bit smaller than are the egg cells. Sometimes we call the eggs ova instead. So one ovum, several ova. Um, so sperm cells are quite small. Ova are quite large. So um, a sperm cell would be just three micrometers. That's, mm, I didn't do a very good job. Um, so that's U for micro, mu for micro. Um, so about three micrometers wide and 50 micrometers long, whereas the, our egg cells, these over like 120 micrometers, that's pretty big. So this electron microscope picture is showing this one giant egg cell and all those tiny little baby sperms um, trying to fertilize that egg. The sperm cells have flagella that will allow them to swim pretty well. The head and the tail, the head and the tail are streamlined so that it is easier for them to swim. They can kind of be more efficient with their energy in terms of all the swimming that they have to do. They have very few organelles. So many mitochondria, they do have a nucleus, and that's about it. Um, as opposed to the ova, these egg cells are a little bit more spherical. They have so, so, so many organelles, um, and then they both have that haploid nucleus. I think we talked in class about how our eggs um, have mitochondria, so all of the mitochondria that you have in your body um, come from 
your the egg that made you. So so that's a pretty cool thing. We can look at our mitochondrial DNA as a very uh, uh, narrow, tall and skinny family tree. And my friends, we have arrived at the end of our video lecture on topic B, 2.3 cell specialization. We talked about those roles of stem cells in multicellular organisms. They are self-renewing so that we have a constant supply of stem cells that can differentiate into those specialized cells that we need. We also talked about how we have differentiated cells that are adapted to specialized functions. We talked about gametes, eggs and sperm. We talked about those muscle cells. We talked about the type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes in our lungs. We looked at our objectives. We described stem cells in terms of differentiation and function. Remember that we have um, totipotent and pluripotent, multipot multipotent and unipotent stem cells. We talked about how we can use stem cell therapies to treat disorders. So we can take the nucleus out of an adult cell and plop it into an egg cell. And then we can have these lovely cloned cells that can treat some disorders. We talked about differences in cell sizes. Some are big and some are little. Those really big cells need some um, help with cell surface area so they can feed all the volume inside the cells. Then again, we talked about those specialized cells. Great work today.